Hello, my name is John Stevens. I'm the uh, chair of the Federal Trust, uh, and I'm standing in for Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, um, for this week's podcast. And maybe I'm showing my age, but I wanted to talk about uh, the return of MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction, and the nuclear dimension of the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, which I think has not received enough attention and which could prove to be um, very important uh, for the future of uh, European integration. Clearly, the war in Ukraine is the dominant fact at the moment affecting all aspects of European politics. And it is causing increasing difficulties uh, because the price in terms of the economic impact of the rise in energy prices and the general increase in inflation, the stress that this could put on uh, the Eurozone and on the Eurozone uh, debt uh, market, and the tensions within uh, the EU between Eastern European countries, which feel much closer to the threat posed by Putin's Russia, and Western Europeans whose concerns are that the costs uh, are increasing for them at a time when uh, the demands on their expenditure is likely to be also very great, both in terms of a defense policy uh, and a rearmament program, and also for aid to Ukraine. But clearly giving Ukraine uh, the prospect of EU membership is a historic step and shows that this has been a rallying point, really, for the European idea. And this is against the, the fact that the war itself poses a, a very fundamental challenge to the European idea. I would describe the European idea as being the notion that peace comes through economic integration. And lying behind that, since 1945 has been a general assumption that Europe would not be militarily very significant, that it would be reliant on NATO and reliant, therefore, essentially on the United States and the American nuclear deterrent. Both of those assumptions have been fundamentally undermined by Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Clearly, economic engagement with Russia has failed. It has not prevented the Russians from uh, engaging in this war. And that had been a hope, I think, of many people who had been open to the increasing dependency of Europe on Russian energy, because it was said that on the other hand, that was increasing the dependency of Russia on European funds and European investment. That has clearly not worked. But equally, one of the reasons why this crisis could be so prolonged is because there remains very significant doubts, not least in the minds, I imagine, of Mr. Putin, of how reliable fundamentally the NATO guarantee really is. This war is happening in Ukraine uh, because Ukraine is not a NATO member. And there is always a danger that the war could spill over the latest crisis over uh, Kaliningrad, um, into a NATO country. So the question of how solid is the NATO defense guarantee, how solid ultimately is the nuclear guarantee of the United States in the face of Russia's nuclear capability is a, an open question. And this goes on also to the debate about whether the war is going to be a long or a short one. Is the policy of attrition against Putin's Russia, that it is vital that we prolong this operation to weaken Russia, and that Putin must, in a sense, fail, um, be seen to be defeated, uh, rolled back, indeed, uh, to the 2014 frontiers of Ukraine. Um, that notion does run into a potential problem, which is that because Russia is a nuclear power, if it fails conventionally, it might then resort to nuclear weapons and we would be back in the 
mutual assured destruction scenario of the 1970s and 80s. Um, and that really brings me on to the crucial question of, of the conclusion that Europeans have drawn, I think, from this, particularly the, the French and the Germans, but I think more generally. There is a recognition that there has to be now a very serious European rearmament. But the idea of peaceful power, of Europe being a, an economic superpower, but a military pygmy, that is no longer viable. And that's why the Germans have announced an enormous rearmament program, which if it is fulfilled um, along the lines that are pledged, uh, will make Germany alone, uh, arguably the third largest defense spender in the world. Um, it's a very major change. And if you add the commitments that are being made by other European countries to meet the, the NATO 2% uh, requirement, will make the European Union as a whole um, almost as large a defense spender as the United States. Clearly, because of the divisions within Europe, the, the uh, inefficiencies inherent in having uh, a whole range of member states rather than sim a single government as you have in the United States, will mean that that defense expenditure is likely to be less efficient and less um, uh, impactful. But nevertheless, the numbers are very significant. And beyond that, one has to say that now is a very good time for a very major rearmament program to take place because of the technological changes that are going on, which we've seen partly in the war in Ukraine, the, the importance of drones, the importance of uh, communications, of, of um, uh, satellite guided artillery and the rest, that this is um, a, a moment where a lot of traditional armament expenditure uh, would not make sense. That might also include uh, manned aircraft. Um, the French were rather irritated that the Germans, as part of their rearmament program announced that they were going to be uh, immediately buying some F-35 uh, fighters, the, the most advanced manned warplanes in the world. Uh, they obviously hoped that they would be buying Rafael fighters uh, from them. But uh, the question of whether there should be a, a new um, European uh, manned aircraft, uh, fighter, fighter aircraft or fighter bomber, um, that may no longer be the case because manned aircraft overall may cease to be, be relevant. I just simply give that as, a, as an instance. What, however, is not out of the picture is the question of nuclear weapons. Um, it's clear that the French are going to seek to uh, have a new generation of submarine launch missiles, and it is likely that they will be inviting other European countries, other EU countries, um, to participate in that program, notably, obviously, the, the Germans. But behind that lies the question of, should Europe as a whole, in some form, be a nuclear power? France has indicated that its nuclear deterrent is available for Europe. That was the doctrine set up by President Sarkozy uh, when the French last reviewed their nuclear doctrine. But that may not be really sufficient uh, if Europe is going to have the capacity on its own to deter Russia and not have the doubt hanging over of whether uh, really in the last analysis, um, US forces, NATO forces, it includes obviously the British deterrent, would really be available for a fight in the Baltic states in a nuclear confrontation, conventional confrontation being different. And so what I think is the most intriguing part of the very embryonic discussions on European defense and European rearmament, which are just beginning, which is clearly going to be an enormous program of enormous um, political, uh, strategic and economic significance. So it's, it's worth pointing out as an aside that uh, defense expenditure is a very good way of redistributing money around the European Union uh, when people are talking about the potential of a, uh, of a, of a rerun of the European, uh, of the Eurozone debt crisis. Um, a lot of this expenditure is going to be done in 
uh, Southern Europe. In, in Sp the Spanish are developing a, uh, a new conglomerate that is going to be uh, a, a leader in, in, in defense industries. Um, the Italians have a very important naval capacity as do the Greeks. And building up on that capacity is going to be an important part of any conceivable rearmament program that is paid for at a European level. Uh, by, um, but with major contributions, obviously, from Northern Europe, from, from Germany and from, from uh, the, the Benelux countries and, and Scandinavia as well. So uh, there is a very significant economic dimension to this, as well as a technological dimension, the, the impact, as in the United States, um, of uh, defense expenditure having a boost effect for high tech industries of every kind. But behind this rely, remains the question, is France on its own going to remain the only nuclear power? Or is there going to be some way in which the European uh, Union acquires effective nuclear status by an increase in its capacity? And to conclude, I just wanted to, to hint at some discussions that are going on, which is the, the idea that as part of this rearmament, the... Uh, the European Union should finance <coughs> an additional four uh, ballistic missile submarines. Uh, the French obviously have four at the moment, like the British deterrence, uh, which guarantees that one boat can always be uh, at sea and therefore available uh, for deterrence uh, uh, under any circumstances. But to, to, to double that capacity and to effectively allocate one submarine to Germany, one to Italy, one to Spain, and one to Poland. That seems to be the sort of idea that, that is circulating. Um, that this would be a way of effectively um, Europeanizing uh, the French nuclear capacity. And this would be combined with the development of a, of a new uh, submarine launch missile capability, um, a new, a new uh, a new missile designed and built by uh, jointly by uh, a number of European countries. I think this issue is going to emerge at some point, and the, I'm just giving an indication of the, the discussions that are, that are beginning. But it is obviously of great importance because it is, in some respects, the crucial moment when Europe transitions from being fundamentally an economic enterprise to being something more. And that is the real significance, I believe, of the Ukraine conflict for, uh, for Europe. It is this realization that without a very strong uh, armament in its own capacity, it will be obviously a European pillar within NATO, that is true, but it will be an integrated European pillar within NATO, and it will have a nuclear ca capability that will be effectively uh, able to resist and deter any plausible opponent, even without the support, the full support of the United States, and for that matter, the United Kingdom. I hope you found this uh, analysis of interest. Um, this is obviously a subject which the Federal Trust is going to be looking at in much greater detail as, th as things advance. And much will depend on, on how the war unfolds and on what its war brighter economic impact proves to be. Thank you for listening. Until our next podcast.